My next speaker, does, our next speaker, does not need an introduction, Dr. Chris Dirk, and his presentation is being loaded up right now, and in about 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, it'll be up there. <laughs> so. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, one thing I would tell you, don't drink too many Guinness because after, when you're ready to give a talk the next day. So I'm waking up. <laughs> I had a few too many Guinness last night, but I'll try to be very awake and alert for you. I had my coffee. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about Raynaud's. Uh, perfect day to talk about Raynaud's. Uh, a lot of we picked the right day to have the meeting. But it was, the weather was getting nice there, but unfortunately, it got cold again. So this is a phenomenon that was first described many, many years ago, 1862. The guy that actually described it was Maurice Renaud, uh, a, a French physician. When he described it, he really didn't know what he was describing. He just saw a phenomenon. He didn't know if it was related to anything. He didn't know if this was uh, related to any type of disease. He just thought it was interesting that certain patients had color changes of their fingers, their toes, and other parts of their body, uh, and didn't know if there was some kind of medical relationship. He thought it was a nice curiosity, but nothing more than that. And it went like this for about 100 years. Nobody really made the association that could it be related to something. Uh, this is Dr. Raynaud. They tell me if I grow that beard, I might look like the guy. <laughs> I haven't tried it. It's not very fashionable now to put those beards on. But anyhow, but, and this is uh, not a picture because obviously he didn't have color pictures back there. All right, so it is a common clinical manifestation. Uh, it is recurrent, long-lasting, episodic, vasospastic events uh, of small vessels in our body. It could be the fingers, it could be the toes, it could be the tip of our tongue, nose, ears, nipples. I have patients with scleroderma who try to breastfeed their kids, and it is very difficult because when the mouth, the baby's mouth is cold, they're trying to breastfeed, uh, and the mom is getting Raynaud. So it's very difficult often. Uh, I have to ask those patients to try to pump so they don't get attacks of their Raynaud's while they're trying to breastfeed their babies. Uh, classic symptoms are triphasic, but you don't have to have a triphasic. So it usually starts out with white, discoloration, which is complete obstruction of blood flow. Then there's pooling of blood, which is kind of a cyanotic type phenomenon. And the initial aspect is, a, is painful. Um, and then there's a rush of blood back into the area and there's redness. Um, not everybody goes through that. There's people that can just have the first and the last stage and miss the, the blue one. Uh, if you don't have pain and you just have blue fingers, that's a completely different condition I see a lot of patients in the clinic that they send them to me because they think it's Raynaud's, but it's acrocyanosis, which is not unusual for women. Those patients typically do not have, um, uh, do not have pain with that. Um, this is, I, I don't even know why I'm showing pictures to the group that already could <laughs> show me pictures, but, uh, right, yep. Yeah. I should just put an ice bucket right here and just have everybody come over, right? Uh, <laughs> so there's no rhyme and reason. Patients tell me why this finger, why the other finger, why am I doing, I don't, we don't know. We don't know why. Obviously there's some differences in the vascular structure of each one of our digits. Uh, and there's pe people that have it only on one side, only on the other side, on both sides. If somebody has persistently abnormalities only on one side, I start worrying that maybe it's not the small vessels. I start worrying maybe it's the large vessels. Typically with uh, scleroderma, we worry about microvascular disease, small vessel disease, but there are patients with macrovascular disease as well, which is large vessel disease. And unfortunately, we forget about that. And if we have somebody who has Raynaud's that is severe and they're getting gangrene and ulcer is only on one side and they don't have it on the other side, you need to start looking, is there anything up there higher up? And typically the, the artery that gets involved mostly is the ulnar artery, not so much the radial, because the radial is a much bigger artery. So the ulnar artery is not unusual for us to find an occluded ulnar artery and sometimes we will have to send the patient 
to go and have bypass. Now, does that always work? Sometimes it doesn't work. But I just wanted to put that out there. If the Raynaud is only on one side, we need to be a little bit aware of other things that it could be. This is the cyanotic stage of the process, so the, where the blood kind of pools in the area before the blood rushes back into the area, and then there is a, a, a flow of, uh, of, of blood, and there's redness, and burning and tingling. And unfortunately, often what we use to treat it can actually bring on pain. And it's such a difficult situation because here we have sores on your fingers that are painful, uh, and you want something for the pain, and we're trying to avoid pain medications because they can actually be vasoconstrictors. And then we open up the blood supply with some sort of medication, and there's a rush of blood into the fingers, and now you're telling me, oh my God, my fingers are now burning, they're hot, they're annoying, they're painful, and I try to convince you it's a good thing, and you tell me, you curse me out, but you don't say it to me, but... Uh, so it, it is a difficult situation because, unfortunately, that's a good thing when the blood is coming back, there's, there's a lot of pain. Uh, we haven't figured out how to do it without causing that pain, unfortunately. You can get early on when the events are, are significant, you can start having little ulcerations and breaking the skin. Uh, you can get sores uh, uh, and break uh, of the skin. This is a scabbed over. You can see this patient has actually lost part of the tip of their finger because of uh, recurrent uh, ischemia. You can develop dead tissue in the area. Uh, now, typically, when this happens, I, I, my patients ask me, is there anything? There, unfortunately, there's not much you can do at that point. Uh, you just hope that there's a lot of redness right there, which means that there's flow of blood coming to the area at least underneath the scab, and you hope that the scab will slowly fall off. There's a lot of questions. Should you send the patient to the surgeon to remove it or not, or let it drop, fall off by itself? As long as it doesn't get infected, we try to uh, allow it to fall off by itself. It can take a long time. It can be quite painful. Uh, we don't like a lot of procedures to be done on the tips of the fingers because clearly the cir circulation is poor if something is cut the wrong way. But if somebody really needs it, then we proceed and have somebody remove it. By the way, anybody can ask me questions at any time. If Raynaud's always hurts. Yes, most of the time it hurts, yeah. So what when the last one does not hurt? Great. That, that's, that's, a, that's a plus. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It could be acrocyanosis. It could be just, uh, so it could be some, this other condition, um, which is typically seen in women, which also the Raynaud's is more commonly seen in women. And it's just pooling of blood. We don't know exactly the pathophysiology of that. Does it do damage? No, no, it doesn't. It just looks funny. Uh, you might have more sweatiness to your fingers uh, and, numbness. And, and numbness, but <laughs> there's just pooling of blood, especially if there's no pain and just the blue phase. It's usually acrocyanosis. So there's other conditions, actually. There's other diseases that can cause it. If you're not oxygenating yourself well, that can happen from that. Uh, and there's some other rare diseases that can cause bluish discoloration. You mentioned that if it's only on one side, maybe it's because of the kidney and the upper artery. Uh, is it possible, though, if it's on both sides, that it's still be coming from? It could. That's a good question. It could. It could. If, if we have very, very resistant disease, Sometimes we'll, we'll proceed and try to get imaging studies to see the circulation up top. Um, so, but is that a block? I mean, is it a blockage, or what is causing it? It's rare. That's why I wanted to put it up. It's very rare that you have a, a large vessel blockage, but it is a possibility. It is a blockage, yeah. And I'll show you pictures later. Acrocyanosis. It's the, the distal. Acrocyanosis is just the distal is cyanotic. It's really. We make up the words to make it difficult. <laughs> Otherwise, why would you come and see me, right? <laughs> All right. And more severe. Again, but you see, there's good blood flow here. There's good blood flow here. The event has happened. It's done. 
There's not much you can do at this point. You just have to wait for the tissue. And we, we try our best, and often even our best is not good enough because the circulation is completely occluded, and unfortunately this can happen. And even with all these strong medications that we have, uh, sometimes we cannot get it not to go there. And again, you can get it also in other areas of your fingers. Most of the time you get it at the tips of your fingers, but you can also get it on your knuckles. Sometimes with the knuckles, it could be Raynaud's or it could be because the skin is so tight that it actually cracked open and it's a crack. It's often hard for us to tell if these are vascular related or is it just because how stretched out the skin is and it's breaking, um, so it's hard to know. So often I have patients that I will give the medications and the source down here are helped, but then the ones on the knuckles will not be as helped and then I realize potentially that they're not vascular related. Uh, distribution is worldwide, but as you can see, if you live in South Carolina, you're better off. <laughs> um, I hate to say it, you picked the wrong place to live. <laughs> so it is better. Disease looks different in southern, uh, in southern Europe, in southern parts of the United States. Um, it is m somewhat more manageable. There's less Raynaud's. Raynaud's also may be the driving force of the disease in some ways, as the vasculopathy may drive part of the disease, the fibrosis and the inflammation that comes on. Uh, often, if I could write your prescription to move to Florida, I would write it, but I don't know if your insurance would cover it. Uh, prevalence is uh, high in connective tissue diseases. As you can see, 90 or more percent of people with scleroderma have Raynaud. Uh, so if we have a patient like the patients that Dr. Ligon was describing, and they have very strong changes of Raynaud, we start thinking, is there, a, is there a rheumatoid with severe Raynaud? Is there a flavor of scleroderma in there? So when somebody has very aggressive Raynaud, we start thinking, is there a scleroderma flavor, even though they're lupus uh, typed out, or even though they're rheumatoid typed out. Typically in lupus, only about 30% of patients, Sjogren's about 32, dermatomyositis and polymyositis about 20, and rheumatoid patients, only about 15% of patients have Ray, Ray nods. Um, we dis, we split, split it up in primary and secondary Raynaud's. Uh, primary, uh, we have a lot of patients that come to see us for Raynaud's. Most of the patients do not have a connective tissue disease. They're usually young females that don't have lupus, they don't have scleroderma, they don't have anything wrong with them. They just have Raynaud's. It has to do with estrogen, it has to do with something, uh, uh, hormone changes, uh, and usually uh, painful and has, can have a lot of symptoms, but usually more of a benign course. And often this is something that we're looking at right now to try to diagnose scleroderma early. Um, and there's a, a project called the Very Early Diagnosis of Sclerovetos Project, which is done by, in Europe, and they're looking at these patients with Raynaud's and puffy hands, and they're trying to figure out who's gonna go to scleroderma, who's not gonna go. Can we detect early the scleroderma, hit it hard, and get it before it goes to a more aggressive form of the disease? So the differences when we classify Raynaud's, um, primary versus secondary. So typically with primary, these are young patients, they're less than 30. So if I have a patient in their 50s that comes to me and says, hey, two years ago I started having Raynaud, I start worrying about this side, not this side. But if I have an 18-year-old that is brought in from mom and dad because they have Raynaud and they say, want to make sure that the, the, the kid doesn't have scleroderma, I'm happy to say that they're falling more in this side. But then there's other things. Um, the capillaries, when I look at the capillaries, they're normal, they're abnormal over here. Over here. The antibodies may or may not be uh, positive, but typically positive over here. And then there's gangrene or damage, or damage to the skin itself on the fingers is very rare with primary, not unheard of. Uh, you can actually get it at times, but more common in patients with secondary Raynaud's. Any questions or? No. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't think anybody ever looked at that. Primary to secondary Raynaud. 
it was probably secondary and just so. Uh, Heated socks. People that go to football games have the right gear. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I so I tell some of my patients if they go to uh, outlets where they sell clothes for people that go to football games, they have everything. They have things in the gloves uh, because they are sitting out there in sub zero temperatures looking at guys killing each other. So. All right, so Raynaud is seen in many diseases, but also in, in, in other things as well, but scleroderma, lupus, dermato, vasculitis. But you can get it from uh, mechanical problems. So if somebody works uh, with, uh, with a vibrating equipment or a uh, jackhammer, we have people that are jackhammer workers that come in with damage to the nerves of their fingers that develop Raynaud's, and they do not have scleroderma. People that have had frostbite injuries as children can develop brain odds, and again, don't have a connective tissue disease. People that were using the crutches the wrong way and they were pressing too much into the bundles right here and damaged those nerves in the vessels. Patients who have thoracic outlet syndrome. Certain hypercoagulable states typically don't give you brain odds, give you something that mimics brain odds, but if, if the doctor is well aware of brain odds, can actually differentiate that and find out which patients have thickening of the blood versus vasospasticity of the blood vessels. And then there's a lot of medications, and these are a lot of medications that you should try to avoid as much as possible. So clearly, you shouldn't be smoking. Nicotine causes a lot of vasoconstriction. Um, try, I mean, again, this is a difficult case because some of you have to take pain medications because there's sores on your fingers, but unfortunately, there could be a vicious cycle where you take care of the pain, then it causes vasoconstriction. Sometimes we allow a small dose of narcotic because the pain is so severe to balance things out. But remember, if you take too much of it, it can actually bring on more vasospasticity of the vessels. Pseudoephedrine, so if you, have, if you want to take a decongestant for your cold, I always tell my patients, ask for the pharmacist to give you the one that is for hypertensive patients which has less of those type of agents, so it has less of a vasoconstrictive effect. So if you have the cold, go, just say, lie to the pharmacist. I have hypertension, which one are, am I gonna get? And you're gonna get the one that doesn't constrict the vessels as much. Uh, uh, of course, I hope nobody's doing cocaine. Avoid cocaine as much as possible. <laughs> Beta blockers, unfortunately, some patients have to take them because they have heart disease. They had a heart attack, they have AFib. At that point, we have to balance the benefit, the risk. Beta blockers will worsen Raynaud's. It's a test question often on boards for our fellows. Uh, what medication do you use or not use for Raynaud's? So again, there's certain chemicals that have been related, people that have worked in the plastics industry, exposure to arsenic, and also some endocrinological disorders such as carcinoid and thyroid disease. Now, there's a lot of chemicals that go into play. It's not as, um, I, I know when you guys come to the office, we say this, 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 we make things sound easy, but there's all these things running in our brains. So there's many chemicals that play around. So there's chemicals that are produced from blood vessels, and then there's chemicals that are produced by nerves. And all these things are, jumbled up and abnormal in scleroderma. So certain of the vasodilators are low, certain of the vasoconstrictors are high, specifically endothelin in scleroderma. Certain of the nerve-derived vasodilators are low, and certain of the vaso nerve-derived vasoconstrictors are high. So we've tried to play around with some of these chemicals, either upregulating the dilators or downregulating the constrictors. Uh, it's tough though, very tough because you don't know, each one of you is probably driven by different combination of this. And I don't know which combination you're driven by. 
So I try to do the ones that are the ones that the most benefit that have been shown, but sometimes they won't work, so I have to turn around and try something different. Uh, so you can see how many players are in the mix causing issues and vasodilation constriction. Yes. Is that, is that a, a, a contraindication with? Yeah. I, I, I didn't put that one, but I put uh, ergotamines, which are, again, migraine drugs. Right. So, so, there, it, so if you have scleroderma, you should really have to. No, no, treat your migraines. <laughs> but you have to balance. You might have to increase your, your vasodilators. And then there's the calcium channel blockers that actually work for both. So calcium channel blockers can work for your migraines plus uh, your Raynaud's. You mentioned the hormones. This is a younger woman. Mm -hmm. Was there some sort of connection they're trying to establish between just Raynaud's in general and you know, drop off in hormones? Uh, in primary, that, that's the right. That is what is thought. Secondary, we don't know. But I mean, clearly, there has to be sound because Six uh, scleroderma patients are women. One patient is male. So, they, so there is some estrogen effect. Have they tried hormone replacement to see if it affects the range? Well, um, hormone replacement will probably make things worse. So the things that we have done, and not in this disease, but in lupus, we've tried to give male hormones in low doses, but all the side effects that go with that. So DHEA has been tried in lupus. Uh, and which is, again, a female dominant disease. And it seems Petrie's paper, I think Petrie's paper was, uh, that showed that at 200 milligrams of DHEA, there's some benefit in mild, to, mild cases of lupus. But you know, you have the risk of growing hair where you don't want it. Uh, you can, I want it here, but it doesn't <laughs> come here. <laughs> My kids are like, grow it out. It doesn't grow. <laughs> Anyhow, but unfortunately, there's, there's side effects. There, there, so so I, have, I have lupus patients that take DHEA, but it, it does cause um, hair growth where you don't want it. You can develop acne because it's a testosterone-like substance, um, moodiness, uh, hair, uh, male pattern baldness. So it's a balance. No, uh, it, the one that the one that it has the most studied and the best results is calcium channel blockers. Uh, calcium channel blockers. Beta blockers are a negative. Uh, actually, they cause the reverse. But if you need them, you have to take. And usually long-acting calcium channel blockers, not short-acting. They've tested short-acting. They don't work. It has to be long-acting calcium channel blockers. Could you talk a little more about exposure to tools and items that vibrate, electric toothbrushes you're using uh, to shake your hedges, et cetera? It can cause, so any vibratory equipment can cause damage to the nerves because I mean, it, again, you have to be doing it a lot, though. You have to be somebody who's, that's your job. Uh, it won't be somebody like, I mean, I go and do it. I might have a little bit of hand pain because I'm a sissy typing on the computer all day long, all right? But, you know, the guy who's doing it all day long, he's getting, so somebody, uh, I think you have a patient who is a jackhammer operator, severe Raynaud's to the point that I think he's getting digital ulcerations, right? Right. So, I mean, this, this person is like this all day long. And, you know, imagine your hands shaking all day long. The nerves slowly get damaged, and then you don't have as well of control. So you go out in the cold. The vessels are supposed to constrict a little bit. They're not doing what they're supposed to, to, con to bring the, the blood to the center of your body, and they're not doing the right thing for him. So it, it's, it's not the little things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's somebody who's doing a lot of it. So... Yeah, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. I'll talk. I mean, nitroglycerin, 
is one treatment, but it, it has a many, many side effects because it absorbs systemically, it gives you a headache, it dilates everything in your body. Uh, so it's, uh, we, there was a study not so long ago trying to find a, a way to put nitroglycerin on your finger to slowly absorb. The data is, was decent, but I didn't see the product on the market yet. So it means that maybe the company decided against it. Uh, it was something that was studied recently, actually. I forget the name of the product. Though. Which one? Um, well, any medication. I, I work for compounding for animals, so yeah, it's just compounding. Compounding only if I cannot get something that, uh, I mean, compounding I use mostly, to be very frank with you, when I to have patients use medications for sores in their mouth. That doesn't often, I like to create my own cocktails. Uh, and sometimes if you get the branded, it's very expensive, but in compounding, Again, it's hard to find a place that compounds anymore. So I think with those, I've had success, but I don't know. So they have, I've used com compounding topicals for what happens with virus pain, because that helps with the pain. I think we don't talk about this. And then sometimes they can actually mix into that particular, um, whatever, you know, compilation, like the, uh, gobble pentane or not pain. That's probably one of those But it's variable result, and you don't you don't know how much it's going to absorb. And unfortunately, they are very expensive and not covered. So we tried it when it was pink. I used it. Good boy, strong voice. <laughs> you didn't drink any Guinness last night. That's a problem. <laughs> All right, so this is a schematic I had put together with uh, Sergio Jimenez back in 11 years ago. So this is the theory, and this still holds true as the theory of what's happening. So there is an upregulation of TGF-beta, and most of you that have had scleroderma know that this is the, the driving force for this disease. You know that TGF-beta-1 is really the, the cytokine that drives this disease. Um, as well as connective tissue growth factor, it is released it goes, uh, binds to the fibroblasts and changes the, changes the fibroblasts of the vessel. This is a vessel, by the way. This is a vessel cut in half. This is the vessel wall, this is the lumen, this is where the blood goes through. So we have all these cells in the vessel wall, but what it does, it changes the, 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 the phenotype of the vessel. It changes it from, from a fibroblast to a myofibroblast. So not only you have thickening of the vessel wall, but this vessel wall now has a stronger ability to do this because it, it has become like, uh, it has a muscular effect, a contractile ability now. So it has changed the cells into this. So there's more con um, sensitivity to chemicals that would cause constriction. There's also something going on with the vessel wall. We don't know exactly. There's some injury to the vessel wall. We all think that that's the in inciting event of the disease itself. Um, and then it allows uh, white cells to bind to the vessel wall, migrate through the vessel wall, and release chemicals in the vessel wall. And those chemicals drive this process. So it, the difference between, if I cut the vessel of a patient with primary Raynaud's, the vessel will look completely normal. If I cut a vessel from a patient with secondary Raynaud's, scleroderma, lupus, rheumatoid, whatever, the vessel will be thickened, the lumen will be more narrow, and if you look at the quality, the, 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 the tissue is different, meaning it's more contractile. All right, uh, so the biggest things that we do and try to figure out the disease is we look for the nail beds and we do a few blood tests. This is for patients who come in for primary Raynaud's, uh, usually the young patients, and these are the highest predictors. So when I teach this to my primary care colleagues, I tell them if you can do these two, three things right here in red, you can decide if which patient goes to the rheumatologist and which patient should go and stay in your practice. Um, nail fold capillaroscopy is very easy to do. We do it in the office. 
There's many different devices. You can just use the ophthalmoscope. I do that on my patients, and you see me doing that on you sometimes to look at the capillaries. I'm not trying to look at your nails. I'm not trying to look how well your nails are. <laughs> Some people tell me I'm, I, I didn't, I, I, my polish is bad. I'm not looking at the polish. <laughs> I'm looking at the little cuticle, okay? I'm looking at where the, the nail bed, uh, the blood supply of the nail bed. And this is what we see. A lot of times patients ask me, what do you see? And this is where I show you what I see. So this is somebody who is normal. These are little, so this is where I'm looking, not the nail, the cuticle. And you see these little blood vessels are nice and straight. Early on, with mild disease, you start getting these dilated capillaries and a little bit of dropout right here, lack of capillaries. As the disease progresses, the Raynaud's progresses and gets worse, you can have large areas of no vessels and these squiggly, unusual capillaries going all over the place. And when it, the Raynaud's is even more worse, you can start having <coughs> vessels going in all kinds of directions. Probably your body trying to regrow some of these vessels to try to feed back the nail bed. Uh, and, and, and you can see large areas. And that's why I often tell my patients, you know, if you go to the nail salon, don't allow anybody. I know everybody goes and has the cuticle cut, but, you know, this is your blood supply there. Uh, so I tell my patients, please don't do your cuticles when you go to the nail salon. Avoid that. Uh, because you can damage and, you know, you can get a sore in that area. All right, non-pharmacological ways of improving this, avoiding the cold temperature. Good luck with that. Uh, so that means you go into your house in October and you come out in March. Uh, I tell my patients, uh, again, this is not based on science. I tell my patients, you know, if you have a bathtub at home, uh, go sit in the bath in the morning and sit in the bath at night. It warms up your core temperature, it elevates it. It doesn't last for too long. A shower just kind of superficially warms you up. But if you sit in the bathtub, it elevates your core. Uh, good reason to tell your husband to put buy you a jacuzzi, right? Uh, you have to keep the whole body. Uh, so I cannot, when, uh, it, again, I, when I see somebody coming in with gloves, this, this, and then flip-flops, I'm like, what? <laughs> what happened here? So it's not just the areas where you're having the problem. It's everything. You have to cover up everything. Uh, and I've seen that, believe it or not. <laughs> stress, stress is an important thing. They did research to see if biofeedback helps. In research, it doesn't help, but stress definitely has a So physical, emotional stress, uh, you know, uh, if you get sick, clearly your Raynaud's is going to get worse. If you have an infection, this, that. So again, again, easier for me to say this than you, but it is important to try to minimize stress. Avoiding certain medications that can cause vasoconstriction. Calcium channel blockers are the ones that have shown the best. They, they have shown these results. This is more than a decade ago that we know this. But you have to be careful, especially with uh, nifedipine. It has to be the long-acting form of nifedipine. Amlodipine is long-acting, and there's other agents that you can use as well. Um, but it's 66% reduction in attacks. ACE inhibitors we use, it's controversial, but we do use them at times when uh, calcium channel blockers don't work. ARPS or Losartan specifically has shown in one small study results better, better than nifedipine. Topical nitrates um, are okay to use. Uh, unfortunately, many patients get headaches and flushing and this and that, and they have a hard time using them. If there is a formulation that comes out though in the future that gives you a more controllable dosing of it, because right now you just slap some, you put it on, you don't know how much you slapped on. If you squeeze too much the tube, you might have squeezed too much. Then, oh my God, I can't hold my head up. So anyhow, when things get bad, we do have protocols to put you in the hospital. Uh, and we do have, uh, which one was approved here recently? A prostate. So uh, this is what, when I was at Jefferson, we used that. I guess it was approved now. We use this at Penn. Again, this is for somebody who has critical ischemia, somebody who 
the finger is not turning back to red. It's staying white. And this is an emergency for us. So if, you, if that ever happens, it is important to let us know. We usually put those patients in the hospital and we start IV medications of this to try to open up the vessel as soon as possible. Um, um, they have many side effects, so we don't do it lightly. So we have to really decide who really needs it. Uh, it's somebody who is really critical. Um, we have, we are starting to use some of this. There is an agent here that is oral and inhaled form. Some of my patients, my most severe patients, use an inhaled form of this. Uh, it is difficult to get though. You have to help, get help from your pulmonary hypertension group uh, because it's hard to come from a rheumatologist. And also, I don't know, in in-house, we have to have PAH. The, the pulmonary hypertension doctors have to prescribe this. And there's recent data on this age and the oral form for Raynaud's, and it looks promising, but not yet there. Uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, I think everybody knows a little bit about them. The small case series have been positive. Uh, there was a, a large study called the SEDUCE trial. Unfortunately, that study did not give us positive results, which was the best trial. We still use the agents. It is very hard to do a study in Raynaud's because there's so many factors that I cannot control. So when I give you, and some of you have been in studies for Raynaud's, it is, it, we give you a medication. You don't know if it's the sugar pill or the, uh, the, or the real thing. You go home, but I don't know what stress you have at home. I don't know what your thermostat is at home. I don't know what issues you have at home. I don't know what else is happening at home. I don't know how much you have the air condition at home. So it is very difficult to do Raynaud studies because there's so many things that I cannot control. We give you the stuff, but you go home, you're exposed to whatever your environment is. So also, where do you live? Are you in South Carolina or are you in Ontario? What's happening? Good. No, that's good. That's excellent. No, no, no. It, it was up there. I'm loaded pin was up there. No, no. I missed it. I'm sorry. It's a good drug. I like it. Uh, so it's hard to get this stuff for you guys. They are approved for males with erectile dysfunction. We cannot get them for Raynaud's. So you can get an erection, but you, cannot, you have to lose the finger. <laughs> so I've written letters. I don't know why. They don't go through. So we usually try to see if there's any, a little bit of pulmonary hypertension on your ultrasound. So sometimes we push you to get a, a, an ultrasound to see is there a smidgen of elevation of the pressure so we can write, uh, oh, the patient has mild pulmonary hypertension, so we can get the medication. So this is, unfortunately, the, the stuff that we have. If you also, if you go on the website for, for the respective company, they have these trial coupons. So I guess you just have to say that you are a male and having erectile dysfunction. And <laughs> so what you're learning here, we're teaching you how to lie. <laughs> Uh, you, I didn't say that either. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Hopefully, we'll, it will be more available. But right now, that's sort of the way we get the, the medication. Uh, endothelin receptor inhibitors, Bosentan, had uh, two studies here in the United States. Uh, both studies were not deemed by the FDA good enough for it to be approved for Raynaud's but it was good enough for the European FDA. So this is approved in Europe, but not in the United States. Um, it, it, it suggests reduction of new digital ulcers, but not improvement of the ones that are already there. So uh, in Europe, this is a, a, a therapy for severe Raynaud's and typically uh, uh, avoiding having new digital ulcers. Recently, um, 
We, uh, I was involved in a study of Masi Tendan. I think uh, two of you in the crowd here have actually been part of the study. And unfortunately, when we got the data back, which was published about a couple months ago, the data showed that it was no better than placebo. So that kind of, which is another endothelin receptor blocker like this one. And unfortunately, the data was not strong enough for the FDA to say, and it was really a, a, a equal to placebo type of effect. Um, we use other things, again, more historically based, not so much because of data or evidence base. Uh, we use aspirin, we use pentoxifilin to thin out the blood uh, and get the platelets and the blood to go through the blood, uh, the, the narrowed vessels. Uh, this is Plavix, we use that as well. Uh, and especially somebody who has a very low blood pressure and we cannot use vasodilators, we try to thin out the blood to get the blood supply where it needs to go. Uh, you can do sympathectomies for severe patients. They work uh, for critical situations. You can do it uh, either locally and do a sympathectomy. This is damage to the nerves and damage to the nerves here or you can do it up high in the cervical region. I know some of you have had these procedures done. Um, it can help and get somebody out of a critical situation where they are not able to get any results with medications. We need a surgeon though to do it because they really damage the nerves either here or here. Uh, Botox therapy is also something that is being looked at in the hand literature. It looks uh, promising right now and I have had a few patients that had to go for Botox injections into the palm to try to decrease, paralyze sort of the muscles and decrease some of the vasocontractility in the vessels. <laughs> uh, other things that have been looked at, uh, but in small sort of studies, um, uh, SSRIs, which are antidepressants, seem to have some benefit. Statins, questionable. Niacin, which is a cholesterol-lowering drug, not because of its cholesterol lowering effect, but because it, it kind of makes you flush, and that flushing increases. Uh, it, so we are actually using the side effect of the drug to, as a benefit. Um, Gingo no better, has been looked at against calcium channel blockers. Uh, these are vitamins that have been looked at. This is not a vitamin on the bottom, <laughs> uh, just to let you know. Uh, but these have been looked at, I mean, I have no issues if my patients want to take some of this stuff, if they help. Red wine, if you get flushing because it has sulfites in it, red wine can actually do the same thing as niacin does. It gives you sort of a, a release. If you get that reaction to red wine, if you don't get that reaction to red wine, you're not going to get any benefit. Doesn't have to be a, you don't have to become an alcoholic. Small amount of alcohol, what it does, it makes you flush, it vasodilates, and it allows your Raynaud's to feel a little bit better. Um, again, you have to have that reaction to it. Um, another product over the counter, which is a vitamin that I didn't put it up there, niacinamide, is also similar to niacin, also has a little bit of a vasodilatory uh, effect. We use it, it has been looked at in something called chilblains, which is a, a, a disease seen in maybe lupus, uh, again, it's not up there, but it's a, sort of a vitamin over the counter. Niacinamide is the name. All right, that's it. That